Before his death, Obi-Wan said, If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. But did he? What can a Force Ghost actually do? What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to be a deep dive into Force Ghosts in canon. Who can become one? Can they interact with the physical world? How does this ability work for Dark Side Force users? And a bunch of other stuff. So let's start with the actual process. All of the sightings of Jedi Ghosts that we see in the original trilogy were all brought about by one man. Zack Bagans. Yep, sorry, Qui-Gon Jinn. See, Jinn was always a bit too outside the box for the Jedi Council, and through being open to all kinds of strange Force practitioners, he eventually discovered the Wills, beings that inhabited the very planet that was the wellspring of the galaxy's midichlorians. In effect, this place was a junction between the Cosmic Force and the Living Force. The simplest way to think of those two concepts is that the Living Force has to do with the physical world around us including even your emotional state caused by the events of the here and now, while the cosmic force is more like the will of the universe. The living force is affected by the will of conscious actors in the material world, like people, but the cosmic has its own will, the closest thing to a sort of god in the Star Wars universe. Whether that gets split into a sort of god being the light side and a devil pushing the dark side, or if they are both just the expression of a single will of the force is an enormous debate for a separate video. For our ghostly research, just know that the real trick is to be able to transfer your consciousness in the living force into the cosmic force. That way your consciousness can live on even when you're, well, no longer living. This midichlorian planet, like the midichlorians themselves, can be thought of as acting as a portal through which consciousness and the force pours into the material world. It's how Star Wars solves a timeless philosophical problem from our world. If everything is just unconscious matter and energy, then how does that create a conscious being? In Star Wars, they have that mystery plus the element of force powers, but both are just drawn from the cosmic force into the living force through this midichlorian junction. So the Shaman of the Wills on this planet is perfectly placed to teach Qui-Gon Jinn how to flow his consciousness into the cosmic. The birthplace of what Jewish science calls midichlorians. The foundation of what connects the living force and the cosmic force. By the way, this whole scene from the Clone Wars is basically an expansion of a bit of amazing dialogue that was written by George Lucas for Revenge of the Sith, but it was cut out from the final version. It is between Jin and Yoda and reads, Qui-Gon as a voiceover. Patience. You will have time. I did not. When I became one with the force, I made a great discovery. With my training, you will be able to merge with the force at will. Your physical self will fade away, but you will still retain your consciousness. You will become more powerful than any Sith. Yoda, Eternal Consciousness. Qui-Gon voiceover. The ability to defy oblivion can be reached, but only for oneself. It was accomplished by a Shaman of the Wills. The Clone Wars TV show also mentioned that because Qui-Gon died before fully developing this Force Ghost ability, he was only able to speak as a disembodied voice. You must complete but I could not. When he visually appears on Mortis, that's because it was a nexus in the Cosmic Force, the analog to the Will's living Force planet. What is this place? Unlike any other, a conduit through which the entire force of the universe flows. By helping guide Yoda to the Will's, he sets him on the path to mastering this ability. The place Qui-Gon spoke of, I believe this is. But Jin would also continue to work on his own abilities from beyond the grave. And in the book, from a certain point of view, we get a ton of insight on what it's like to be a Force ghost. Let's start with the fact that Qui-Gon is able to see into the future and the past. The Force is outside of our concepts of space-time. It is in the consciousness realm. And we can really see what that means through the story of how Jin appeared before Obi-Wan, just after Luke ran back home in Episode 4. The conversation turns to Anakin and Jin decides to abandon the topic knowing that, quote, these things can be discussed at another time, when they are beyond the crude human language. Soon. Very soon. Over the nearly two decades of Obi-Wan's exile, he was visited by the voice and eventually bodily form of Qui-Gon who taught him the secret of what we call becoming a Force Ghost. When he says that very soon he will be able to talk to Obi-Wan without the encumbrances of regular language, it is because he knows that Kenobi will die soon. It's unclear how much detail Qui-Gon has, but while talking to Kenobi, he also mentions that he sees him as the boy at the Jedi Temple, the Clone Wars General, and the Hermit all at the same time. That's the timeless part. But we also get the incredible detail that if a Force Ghost can manifest themselves substantially enough, they can experience sensory perception. Quote, The droids have begun cremating the Jawa bodies. 
Qui-Gon is substantial enough now to smell the ash, but he is of the Force, and so he feels Luke's pain and horror as truly his own. So think of it this way. You're smelling a pumpkin pie. Its occurrence in your mind was the result of a physical stimuli, namely molecules landing on olfactory receptors, making up your sense of smell. But then you also have an opinion or thought about that smell. It may be gross, smell amazing, or remind you of some other memory. That is all your subjective, personal consciousness outside of just the physical world. Qui-Gon has gotten so good at manifesting as a force ghost that he can smell the delicious Jawa barbecue. But also, since he is of the very force that is the wellspring for all consciousness, he can experience all of Luke's thoughts as well. Both of these traits combine in the very next sentence. The sight of the burned bodies of Owen and Baru Lars is as vivid as Obi-Wan standing only centimeters in front of him. So Qui-Gon can be both in all time and in all locations, and when he's forced ghosting into the physical world, he can also experience all those thoughts and sensations. Now with Obi-Wan's manifestation, we don't really get any more info. Ghosts can sit on things, I guess. But really there's nothing here that provides any new ghost abilities or details. And for both Qui-Gon and Obi, we never see them change anything in the physical world. Even Jin's was just experiencing the pain of what Luke was going through, but it wasn't like Qui-Gon stubbed his own toe walking around Kenobi's place. It wouldn't be until Yoda that we see a Force ghost actually interact with things. The lightning was impressive, and whether he caused the bolt to appear, or just changed the weather which then created a bolt is unknown. But all that matters is that he definitely caused it to hit the tree. Unbelievably cool fun fact here, but this tree on Luke's island is from the original tree in the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, the place where Yoda returned after his journey with the Wills, the place where he came to understand and accept the fact that the Jedi Order would soon fall. Through this path, victory we may yet find. Not victory in the Clone Wars, but victory for all time. Here he is all those years later because of the teaching of the Wills, helping Luke to let go of the material representations of the Jedi Order as well. But though the lightning was a more shocking display of ghost powers, I really think hitting Luke with his cane was more impressive. It's funny to think that you can manifest your cane as a ghost too, but really I guess it's no more odd than appearing with all your clothes. What is striking is that Luke can feel getting hit by a ghost cane. If this is true, then technically a Force Ghost should be able to affect whatever they want. And when you combine it with Qui-Gon's account, experiencing all time at once, being in all places at once, with the ability to smack people in the physical world, I guess a Force Ghost really is... More powerful than you can possibly imagine. So can a Force Ghost operate however they like? Not really. Think of it this way. This is gonna sound odd, but it's like singing karaoke. When you're singing karaoke, you are still perceiving the physical world around you. Things like the beat, the crowd, and the room may be said, but it's really you singing the words. The way the song is rendered when you sing it is unique to you, but the words are already written. That doesn't take away from anything though, because you wouldn't change it, you love the song. I.e., in this case, if you are a Force Ghost, you are an enlightened being that loves existence and the will of the cosmic force. So you genuinely want to sing the words of the Force's song exactly as they are. You choose this even though you didn't personally choose the words themselves. I.e. you didn't choose the fate or destiny. This gets to the very reason why Sith, or any dark side user, can never become this kind of true Force ghost. The Jedi does not want to change the song of the Force. They sing along knowing that its words are perfect. Even in combat, the Jedi are said to let the Force flow through them. The Sith, on the other hand, dominate the Force and shape it with their own will. They are given a microphone and sing their own song. An analogy in the Aftermath novels is seen with dark side worshippers who wish to carry on the legacy of Vader and Sidious. They call themselves River Breakers. Whereas the Jedi go with the flow, there are those bold and strong enough to go against the current of the Force itself, to go in their own direction. Again, there's dialogue written by Lucas, but was cut from the script of Episode 6, where Yoda explains that if Vader dies while still evil, he will forever be lost to the darkness. A non-existence, no experience of the oneness of the Force, and definitely no retaining his consciousness. It's almost like the evil in the world will take care of itself, that the universe will always have enough evil even if it's relatively rare, but good needs the guidance of these Force ghosts. But again, it's all just the will of the Force itself. 
you get to still be conscious. It's really Qui-Gon, Obi, and Yoda saying and doing things that they want, because they have fully given themselves up to the will of the cosmic force. And so their wants would never differ from what the force wants. But if this is so helpful, why don't ghosts just stay around all the time? Well, to go back to that same story from a certain point of view, we hear Qui-Gon describe what it's like to manifest oneself. As you come out of the oneness of the cosmic force, your awareness leads you to consciousness. The next moment gives you a sense of time. By seeing yourself as a point on a timeline with a start and a now, you feel separate from the force. You feel like an individual. This is what allows all the subjective ecstasies of living beings. But this falling out of bliss is so painful that, quote, the separation is endurable only because unity will come again. As you are now just a piece of existence and a part of a timeline, you recall that others called that fractured state by a name. He hears Obi-Wan say the name Qui-Gon, and memories flood in of this individual. And it, quote, seems to him that he feels flesh wrap around bones, robes over skin, and here he is. And so he calls the other being out there looking at him in this temporal state, Obi-Wan. You see, this is a very disorienting process, even a painful one. And it seems that it's somewhat based on the person's connection to that Force Ghost. Their openness or mutual willingness to commune. So that's the sort of limitations for the manifestation of a Force Ghost. But let's end by talking about Sith Ghosts, starting with Bane. The founder of the Rule of Two may have been encountered by Yoda on his trip to Moribon slash Korriban. Darth Bane! The ancient Sith Lord, you are! This may have also just been a vision conjured up by the Force to test Yoda, but it may have easily been a Sith haunting. Things like scrolls, masks, and weapons used by Sith Lords could be imbued with their essence. These artifacts usually just came to possess strong negative emotions, but there were two that achieved much more. Simply known as the Presence, an Old Republic female Sith transferred her spirit into the Sith Temple on Malachor. She isn't just a residual haunting, not just leftover energy, but makes intelligent responses to Ezra as if it's a conscious entity, a sort of Sith ghost. And, and do you know what knowledge is? Tell me. Knowledge is power. But by far the craziest case is Lord Moment. Also from the Old Republic era, he wanted to use his immense power in the Force to freeze his victims in time at the exact moment of horror at their impending death. He was stopped just as the process was about to be completed, and for some reason this caused his body to disappear and his consciousness to transfer into the mask. The body disappearing part is just like what we see with light side users becoming one with the Force. But instead of his consciousness joining the cosmic plane, it is permanently tied to the mask. The mask was stored in the Jedi Temple vaults, and when questioned why store so many evil things around vulnerable Force sensitives, couldn't we just destroy these artifacts and vanquish the attached evil spirits? The resident ghost expert said simply, Now you gotta remember, I don't glorify any of these people. I have their stuff on display because it is cursed, it's dark, and here we can learn about these tragic events in our history. When Vader comes to possess it, we learn a lot about the true abilities of a dark side user. Momin says that before he died, he created a device that would allow one to use the dark side to reach beyond the veil of the physical world. He says this will allow him to use the dark side to go beyond time, in life and death itself. A dark side version of what we see with a Jedi Temple on Lothal, in the Rebels episode World Between Worlds. In that episode there are a ton of different doorways, and though one was in a Jedi Temple, another opened up to the Sith Temple on Malachor, which had these more Sith looking designs on it. It may be that one of these other portals would have opened up to Mustafar. Now Momin has consciousness, but has no will over the physical world unless he can possess someone wearing the mask. He almost gets Darth Vader, but he throws it off, and then provides Momin with numerous bodies throughout the building of this device. When it's completed, this Old Republic Dark Lord has himself come through the opening in time, and when he grabs the mask, Lord Momin is reborn. In his duel with Vader, he belittles the cyborg's lack of knowledge on the dark side, his childish want to control it and then shows us that he follows the dark side the way the Jedi follow the light. Unlike the other Sith we know about, Momin never wanted to control the dark side. You even see a bit of humility when he is made an apprentice against his will. Despite all his power, he thought it arrogant to refer to oneself as master. Momin says, quote, The dark side does not serve us. We serve the dark side. If we glorify it, it gives us life, even life eternal. Really interesting is that when he thinks he has Vader defeated, he insults Darth Sidious, calling him either ignorant or deceiving Vader. 
But either way, their vendetta against the Jedi is so petty compared to what a Sith's true goal should be. So everything we covered in this video is canon. Could it be that Lord Momin really was serving the Force just like the Jedi? That maybe it is just the act of trying to dominate the Force that gets it to reject you. But if you give yourself over to its will, whether that be dark or light, you can survive your bodily death. But remember, he still was restrained to the mask, and there is something to be said for the fact that he needs machines to open up the veil, while the enlightened light side users can exist in this non-space-time plane through just their connection with the Force. What are you doing? By reducing the flow of oxygen, the body will be forced into a deep meditative state. It will take him as close to death as possible. Yoda, no, this is not the way. But it's a very similar experience, because when Vader walks through the veil that Momin opened, he sees his whole life laid out at once, being the slave boy, the knight, and the monster along with his defeat. Remember that Qui-Gon knew Obi-Wan would soon die, but it's unclear if he knew all the details. Perhaps Jin seeing the future is like this scene where Vader is burned away by the purifying beam of a blue lightsaber. I think it has to be Luke, and with the outfit and saber color, it points to representing the battle on Cloud City. Perhaps Luke's ability to reject the call to evil shook Vader and planted the seeds that he too could deny Palpatine. Also, there is a scene where Vader takes on the Jedi Temple, killing everyone including Yoda. Obviously, this wasn't a literal vision of the future, but he says exactly, let the past die, kill it if you have to. Perhaps he was sort of seeing what Kylo Ren would attempt to do with the Jedi Order, or the other way around. That somehow Kylo Ren got that line from seeing this moment of Vader's past. Let the past die. Kill it, if you have to. But that might be a bit of a stretch. So definitely let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Hopefully this was able to get detailed enough to help you understand how Force Ghosts work in Star Wars. Or really, I should say, understand it the best we can. It's definitely interesting stuff, and it pulls from all kinds of Force lore. Which, of course, gets very spiritual and philosophical. So I definitely want to hear your thoughts on all the different things we covered in this video. The only cool facts and behind the scenes things is the canon implication that Qui-Gon was the first to learn this ability makes Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious even more badass. We mentioned in the podcast book review for the Plagueis novel that you could think of Plagueis as the most powerful Sith ever, since his mastery over the Force was getting so complete that the Force itself had to play a cheat code and just pop Anakin into existence. Him and his apprentice Sidious's reign would be so strong that the good guys apparently also needed to learn the ability to cheat death. And Jin being the first makes his name a little more meaningful, as the Jin in Arabic mythology are spiritual beings ranked lower than angels that get involved in human affairs. It's also where we get the word genie. If you want to pick up any of the sources used in this video, please check out the description below. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support the channel without it costing you a thing, or check out our Patreon, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, manifesting as a Force Ghost ain't easy, so use your Jedi Ouija board responsibly, and the Force will be with you, always.